Well, greetings and welcome to today's video featuring the Panoramic Model 1210 Amp. It was made by Magnetone and is uh, virtually identical to their Model 250. It features True Vibrato and it's the first amp I've ever owned that has uh, that uh, Magnetone True Vibrato. So uh, this should be a very interesting experience for all of us. It was made from 1961 to 1963 and uh, is extremely high quality throughout. I used uh, Patreon and PayPal contributions to buy this on eBay so that we would have an interesting subject for a video. And as you will see, it was money well spent because this is absolutely mint. Let's do the usual procedure where we go all over the outside of it and then uh, take it apart and see what makes it tick. Panoramic was a brand of accordion, I believe, uh, and uh, this amp was made for this accordion company uh, by Magnetone. They just simply changed this nameplate, probably on one of their own 250 amps. Uh, look at the grill cloth. It's absolutely gorgeous. The Tolex is perfect. I've been looking for some white spots, and I think I might have found just a few to make it official. Look at the chrome on the handle, both sides virtually perfect. Let's turn it around and take a look at the back. And the rear view, if anything, is even more impressive. Um, perfect Tolex, original screws, and uh, finishing washers. And let's look at the control panel, high and low gain volume and tone controls with a stereo input on channel one. We'll have to check out the schematic and see what how that works. Then we have a channel two that has the same high and low gain uh, volume and individual tone controls. Then there is a third channel, a vibrato channel, uh, which has intensity and speed and then finally a place for one or two remote speakers. This must compensate for the impedance changes when you plug in extra speakers. We have the anti-hum which I think is going to be a death capacitor uh, connection to ground that alternates between one of the AC wires and the other. The three amp uh, fuse which is pretty husky for a small amp like this, but uh, I think you'll find the circuits rather complex and probably draws a more current than you'd expect from an amp this size. Really nice uh, Rudolph, uh, the, the reindeer's nose here for the pilot light and the all-important on-off toggle switch. Looking into the bottom we see uh, a schematic which has been thoughtfully glued to the floor, the original power cord, two wire of course and then a tag t saying that it is model 1210 serial number 1434 we get a glimpse of what I believe is an Oxford speaker um, so let's pull this back cover here and check inside back door is super nice and it's a pleasure to be dealing with half inch plywood instead of particle board for a change Okay, look at and very nicely uh, covered with Tolex. Also as an added bonus, uh, this amp came with an original brochure uh, showing uh, the Panoramic 1210 amp with all the features and adjustments. Also a little bit fancier 1262 model and on the back uh, we have a 1208 and a 1240. I'm assuming the higher the number the better the amp. Okay, so I love it when I get paperwork like this. It comes with the amp. It's just like you bought it new and you bring it home and this is in the bottom. Makes you happy. It also came with a brochure on panoramic pickups and amplifiers showing our hero Lawrence Welk with his accordion and a lot of interesting stuff here. I'm not a big accordion fancier but uh, for those who are I'm sure this would be the bee's knees. And then something that really gives a human touch to all this is there is in handwritten here a total 
uh, for, uh, I guess, the original purchase of the amp. Because, see, it says $239.50 for panoramic amplifier. And sure enough, it's $239.59 retail in the brochure. So they got a $0.09 cent discount, it looks like. They bought a panoramic pickup, like we saw in this brochure that's offered. And I imagine the accordion was $895. So somebody back in the early 60s forked out uh, $1,274.50 so they could be the life of the polka party. Okay, thank God we got our hands on the amp, though, that one. Uh, and God only knows where the accordion ended up. But I think we got the best of that deal. The tube complement, which appear to be all General Electric brand and probably uh, completely original to the amp, consists of three 12AX7s here in the front row. Two of them are rubber mounted and shielded. Back here is a 12AU7 for the vibrato uh, channel. And then two really nice uh, 6V6s. The absence of a 5Y3 rectifier tube, despite uh, one being shown down here on the schematic, means that this is a later model that went with diode rectification, which boosted the plate voltage and power output a bit. The Alnico 12-inch speaker is covered with that sort of dust that certain metals accumulate, uh, kind of a surface oxidation. Uh, I believe it's an Oxford speaker. The basket looks Oxford to me, although I don't see any uh, EIA codes on the perimeter of the basket. The cabinet construction is absolutely first class. As previously noted, it's one half inch solid, uh, nicely uh, finished smooth plywood. Look at the uniform margin of the grill cloth all the way around. How often do you see that? Like never? Look at the cleats that hold the baffle in. Have two screws each so that they can be unscrewed so the baffle can be easily removed. Okay, I think it's time that we unsolder the speaker wires and pull out the chassis and take a look inside. We'll have to see uh, the plate voltage and bias of these output tubes. Uh, I believe they claim 20 watts output for this amp. It's probably, what, 16 to 18 in real life? Uh, we'll see. I'm not sure what we're going to find in this chassis, but looking at the screw heads that hold it in the cabinet, I see no evidence of a screwdriver ever being on that screw head. So uh, this may be an absolutely virgin chassis. Let's hope so. Well, four screws, one, two, three, and four, and the amp came out just effortlessly. Well, I'm going to flip it over here so we can look inside. See the mysterious varistors. Using my special magnetone chassis support, patent pending, have the chassis out here on the workbench and exposed for all to see. Okay, let's start at this end. I see no evidence of any tampering or work ever having been done to this. Look at this. It's incredible. And judging from the quality of the components, I have a feeling that probably no work will be necessary. I have to check for overheated resistors, things like that. I believe these are the two varistors. They look like the old-fashioned type of resistors that have uh, you know, the body end dot markings on them. But that's them, I guess. Like I said, I, I have no experience with with these magnetone vibrato circuits. Uh, there are the diodes that do the rectification. This would probably be a good time to discuss the nature of varistors. Uh, the name comes from a variable resistor, and as we'll see, it's a very appropriate name. They're made of silicon carbide or zinc oxide. And the unusual properties they exhibit is, uh, with no voltage being applied to them, their resistance can be very, very high. But once you start to apply voltage, the voltage goes up, their resistance goes down, and current begins to flow. Conversely, if the voltage decreases, their resistance goes back up, 
and current stops. Now the purpose that they originally had was sort of like a pressure regulators uh, if a voltage is equated to pressure um, imagine that you have a electrical line here where you want to maintain 100 volts of potential but every once in a while there's a spike that goes up to 120 the increased voltage will cause the varistor to start passing some current and there'll be a voltage drop across that resistor uh, and it will drop enough in other words about 20 excess volts so that the voltage in the line can remain constant in this way they're very much like Zener diodes Zener diodes serve a very similar purpose but as we will see varistors are absolutely essential to the development of the magneton true vibrato there's a huge problem in trying to reproduce or clone magneton vibrato uh, and that is due to the fact that the varistors they used are of really of an unknown value there's no markings on them uh, apparently they're not still made and there's a tremendous variation in varistor performance characteristics it's my understanding that uh, a company has bought the magnetone name and they are reproducing uh, vibrato amps that they spent a great deal of time and effort uh, trying to figure out what the nature was of the varistors and they achieved that but I can guarantee you that uh, that knowledge is not uh, spread around to the general public well much as it pained me to do so I thought it best to replace the original two-wire cord with a chassis grounding three-wire uh, power cord naturally I'm going to keep the original here uh, in a plastic bag and it will stay with the amplifier also I removed one lead uh, of the death cap from the uh, ground switch and uh, super glued it over here to an insulator so that it's out of harm's way it goes with the amp it stays here and it could be returned easily if someone wanted to uh, next I removed all the knobs and washed and waxed the control panel so it looks very much like it did when it was new has a nice uh, gloss to it the knobs are already pretty clean but I polished them up a little more and installed them uh, where they are aimed exactly at the zero point of their setting next step I tested uh, all the electrolytics with an ESR uh, meter and found them all to be uh, well within uh, acceptable limits and I used deoxit to clean all of the potentiometers and the tube sockets next step I plugged the amp into a variac and the variac into a current limiter then I very slowly bring the voltage up to a uh, wall voltage which in this case around 120 volts and check the plate to cathode uh, voltage potential so the plate voltage on the um, 66's is around 296.7 the amp is on now and connected to an 8 ohm speaker I absolutely do not hear any hint of hum or noise it's absolutely silent almost spooky next I measure the resistance of each half winding of the output transformer primary and write it down the left 66 was 246 ohms right is 268.5 then I plug in the amp crank it up to full operating voltage and measure the voltage drop across that resistance and on the right 6v6 it's almost exactly minus 8 volts so I write that down then I change my probe to the plate of the left hand 6v6 and you see it's a little higher voltage drop a little more current flowing in that tube uh, we'll say it's 9.3 okay 9.3 volts negative then uh, dividing the voltage drop by the resistance we see that the left hand 66 is flowing 37.8 milliamps which is a little high the right uh, 66 is flowing uh, 29.8 milliamps which is a little low 
Okay, the PD on the left one, 11.2 watts, which is perfectly acceptable. On the right one is 8.8 .8 watts, which is a tiny bit low. But I really think that uh, these are acceptable values. So I'm going to leave the um, cathode uh, bias resistor, which is 250 ohms, in place and uh, leave the biasing as it is. Now here's a very practical way to uh, assess the uh, quality of the coupling capacitors for your two output tubes. Watch to see if the voltage drop uh, across the output uh, transformer primary is stable. If it's stable, that uh, coupling capacitor is in great shape. If it keeps climbing higher and higher and just runs away from you, then that coupling capacitor is leaking uh, positive voltage to the grid, which is allowing the plate current to increase um, over time dramatically. Okay, so I see no behavior like that here. If anything, it's dropping down a little bit. So uh, I know that the coupling capacitor for the left-hand 6V6 is just fine. Next, I'll test the right-hand 6V6. And as you can see, it's very stable. So both the coupling caps are fine. And now it's time to address the feature that I think you've all been waiting for. I know I have. And that is the vibrato channel which is unique uh, to magnetone amps. But before we continue, we really need to have a brief review of the difference between vibrato and tremolo. Now, a lot of amp manufacturers, including Fender, have made this even more confusing by using the terms interchangeably. Uh, Fender used to call its tremolo circuits vibrato, and the uh, whammy bar uh, that they put on the guitars they would call tremolo and this is absolutely the opposite of the truth. So let's find out what reality really is. And that is that uh, tremolo is strictly volume modulation. If you look at the amplitude of the wave, the amplitude is equal to the loudness or uh, the volume of the wave, the tremolo effect will increase and decrease the amplitude of the wave. Now we're going to have a visual demonstration in just a few minutes that will clarify this. Vibrato on the other hand does not modulate the volume at all. The volume is going to remain the same. It's not going to sound like it does, but it will. Instead, the vibrato is going to alter the frequency. It's going to expand and compress the wavelength to alter the frequency in a rhythmic pattern. Now both of them may sound similar because you're having a rhythmic modulation, either a frequency by the vibrato channel or amplitude by a tremolo effect, but the, you will see that the difference between these two effects is uh, 180 degrees. It's completely, they are completely different. Let's start off with an audio comparison of tremolo and vibrato. Uh, to do that, we're going to use our signal generator to inject a 500 cycle per second signal into channel 1 of the magnetone amplifier circuit. Then we turn up the volume until we can hear the tone through our speaker. Now since the tremolo effect strictly modulates volume, I can create a really good uh, imitation of tremolo simply by varying the volume control. Now let's compare that to the sound of the a vibrato effect. First I'm going to turn up the volume to a similar level and then we'll turn up the vibrato intensity now I think most of you are going to be able to detect right away that there is quite a difference in the way the uh, two effects work uh, at least audibly 
To make the difference uh, even easier to detect, let's do a direct side-by-side -side comparison. First, we'll do the tremolo. Then the vibrato. Tremolo. Vibrato. To me, the tremolo sounds a little more mechanical and a little choppier than the smooth, sort of gradual modulations presented by the vibrato. To me, the vibrato, uh, and this is purely subjective, seems more musical, whereas the uh, tremolo seems more mechanical. Now to make the difference between tremolo and vibrato visibly evident, let's watch on the oscilloscope and see what happens to the waveform of the 500 cycle per second tone when we subject it first to the tremolo modulation and then secondly to the vibrato modulation. Okay, let's try an oscilloscope view of tremolo versus vibrato. Okay, we've got our tone here. We can see our waveform. Now I'll do my volume uh, fluctuating tremolo. Notice how the wave rises and falls. The amplitude increases and decreases. The amplitude is volume. Strictly volume modulation. Now watch what happens with the vibrato. There's no volume modulation. Notice that the wave does not rise and fall like it did with tremolo. Now the frequency is changing. We're compressing and expanding the wavelength. Actually you can see the compressed wavelength and the expanded wavelength side by side. Completely different. Let's take one more look. Tremolo amplitude modulation vibrato frequency modulation they sound somewhat similar but for very different reasons now let's discuss how the stereo input functions first off uh, you must plug in a three element stereo quarter inch jack into uh, this receptacle. Now the jack has to be wired, uh, for guitar at least, uh, with one of the contacts on the stereo jack from the say bridge pickup and the other contact on the stereo jack from the neck pickup. You plug that in and then the bridge pickup will be sent to channel 1 and you can control it and, and with both the volume and tone controls. The neck pickup will be sent to channel 2 where it can be separately modified by the volume and tone controls. Then the two are combined for a single output from the speaker. Now several guitars have been manufactured with an output that can be used with this stereo input uh, capability. They include the ES345 Gibson, the Rickenbacker 4003, and the Gretsch G6120 uh, CGP uh, Chet Atkins a limited uh, production guitar. They uh, have uh, both types of output, one for regular amp and then a stereo output for an amp like this. Or you could actually go into your guitar and wire the two uh, pickups separately and uh, create a stereo a jack that could be plugged in and used in this amplifier. Now just to make it real clear, we'll have a very simple diagram. You see that the neck pickup could be connected to the ring contact on the stereo jack and the bridge pickup could be connected to the tip. Then the other lead from each of the pickups would go to the sleeve. 
Okay, and that way when you plug this in, uh, the neck and bridge pickups will be sent to separate channels of the amplifier. Well, it looks like we got some snow last night. There's Clinch and his little assistant with his nice little Christmas decoration. This is Ollie's house here. I hope she spent the night uh, nice and warm in it. But as you can see, we do get a little snow here. Speaking of the devil, here's Ollie. She spent the night in a different house. We've got a a uh, insulated cardboard house up here near the uh, side of the our house so that it's shielded from the weather. It looks like she did spend the night nice and warm. There she is waiting for her food dish to be filled as it is every morning and evening. Good girl. Here's Ollie investigating to see what snow is. Little morning stretch. She's investigating. She doesn't want to get in it, though, I notice. That's a good girl. Meanwhile, Casey, who is now a full-time indoor kitty, is tending to her grooming. Good girl. She got to stay in last night, where it's nice and warm, and she's living in her new house, which is our house. Good girl. And Jack is up on his ladder, surveying his domain, which includes Ollie in the backyard. So all is well. And here's a new member of our feral, affectionately known as Tennessee Tuxedo, uh, to that little penguin cartoon character uh, back in where, like the 60s or so. Here's Tennessee with a little snow on his face. Ollie still patiently waiting by her on her front porch for breakfast. And finally, here's Ollie enjoying her breakfast on a snowy morning. And here comes Tennessee strolling in for his breakfast. Hopefully he doesn't prefer Ollie's breakfast. Uh-oh. He chases her away. What a bully, huh? That's the way it is, the hierarchy, I guess, in the cat world. Here's that scoundrel peering around the side of our storeroom. Here's Ollie cleaning up after breakfast. Hopefully she got enough to eat, and from the looks of her, uh, she's accustomed to doing that. Okay, now it's time to try to explain to you, in language that's easily understood, exactly how the true vibrato works. Now, I did all sorts of research on this, and it's almost impossible to find any coherent explanation. So I've had to come up with my own, and I hope it makes sense to you, and I hope it helps you understand this uh, rather sophisticated principle. First, let's start off with something we're very familiar with, and that is the oscillation loop that is the basis for tremolo in almost every uh, guitar amp circuit that has tremolo. Uh, we know that it is a chain of three different capacitors, 0.01 in this case, 0.01 and 0.02. And at the nodes where the two capacitors join, there will be a resistor to ground, a resistor to ground, and over here, a resistor to ground. Now I go into much greater detail on how the oscillation loop functions in my tremolo video series. And if you have any questions, you probably need to go there and watch it. But what uh, we saw in that series is that this combination of resistors and capacitors shifts the phase of the signal as it comes around through the loop 60 degrees, 60 degrees, 60 degrees. So we can achieve a phase shift as the signal goes around the loop. 
We'll see in a little while here what phase shift means, but for now uh, just accept the fact that capacitors and resistors work together to change the phase of a signal. Now let's shift our attention to something called the Moses phase shift circuit. All of these names and details and scary diagrams, don't let them put you off because what they do is really fairly simple. What Moses came up with is, let's put a signal into the grid of a triode and then we'll take the signal out of the plate and run it through a capacitor and then we'll take the opposite phase signal from the cathode and run it through a variable resistor. Now, remember in our oscillation loop, the resistors were fixed, okay, fixed value. But in this Moses uh, phase shift diagram and circuit, uh, the resistor is variable. Now, I'll go into more detail in just a second. Now, the two of them are going to meet up right here and mix and then proceed through a coupling cap to the grid of the next triode. Now, here's what he found that was really interesting. We already knew that this, this would happen, that the phase would change as a result of a signal passing through a, a capacitor and a resistor. We saw it in our oscillation loop. But here, because it's a variable resistor, what he found is if you change the resistance, you can compress or expand the waveform, and therefore, therefore you can change the frequency. Now let me demonstrate what that looks like. I created a device here to show how phase shift can affect frequency. Um, I've got a steel rod with a spring and also I've indicated a time interval that extends from the edge of the tape here to the edge of the tape here. The number of coils within that uh, time interval is the frequency. When we shift the signal forward we see how we compress the waveform and we have more coils per time interval. This is higher frequency. When we stretch out or expand the waveform uh, we have fewer coils per time interval and therefore lower frequency. So by phase shifting we can create higher and lower frequencies per time interval. Now, when I saw this, it occurred to me, this is probably how auto-tune works. Imagine if you had a computer controlling the adjustment of this resistor. The singer sings, and the computer knows exactly the frequency of each of the notes. And when the singer is off-key high, then the resistor will be adjusted to bring the frequency down to where it is appropriate. If the singer is flat, he's below the proper key, then the uh, resistor can be adjusted and bring it up to where it should be. Uh, but that's another discussion. It's just, I thought, sort of an interesting application of uh, this Moses phase shift. But that aside, what we need to make our vibrato then is some way to rhythmically alter this resistance. We want it, just like you're grabbing a hold of a potentiometer, we want it to go high, low, high, low, like that, and give us the nice modulated vibrato effect. I think you'll agree it would have to be a little impractical to actually have a potentiometer on our vibrato circuit that uh, while you're playing the guitar and you want vibrato, you have to reach over and move the potentiometer back and forth to vary the resistance. So let's see how magnetone approaches this problem to make vibrato a practical uh, effect on their amplifiers. So what magnetone did is instead of installing a potentiometer in this position they installed a varistor thereby allowing for electrical modification of this resistance rather than physical modification. They also altered the circuit by replacing the capacitor that was in this position with a second varistor. Both varistors then will work with the innate capacitance of the tube itself to provide two separate phase shift 
circuits. This will result in a smoother and uh, more pleasant vibrato effect. Next, they had to come up with some way to apply a varying uh, amount of voltage to each of the varistors so that their uh, resistance would vary and give us our vibrato effect. And to do that, they decided to have an oscillation loop inject a varying amount of voltage, high, uh, down to zero, then negative to zero, positive, negative, like so. In other words, a modulated varying amount of voltage to be applied here to the grid of the tube. Now two things are going to be going on in this triode at the same time. First off, the music signal is going to come in and like in any amplification tube, it will vary the charge on the grid and therefore alter the flow of electrons from the cathode to the plate and output an amplified audio frequency signal. We can hear the music signal. It's going to output this audio frequency signal from the plate and from the cathode. That much is just like any uh, amplification tube function that you've ever seen. But at the same time, something sneaky is going on. The oscillation loop is inputting a signal that is at such a low frequency that you can't hear it. But invisibly, what it's going to do is modulate the charge on the grid so that the flow of electrons through the tube and hence the output voltage will vary in keeping with the frequency of the oscillation loop. So the music signal will come in, uh, not realize exactly what's going on, go on through the amplification process and pass out through the cathode and plate, but the sneaky subaudible oscillation loop frequency is going to cause modulation of the voltage out of the plate and out of the cathode and is going then to change the resistance of the varistors in a rhythmic pattern in keeping with the frequency of the oscillation loop. So when the out of phase music signal from the plate and from the cathode of the triode meet here, they mix and then continue on to the tri uh, grid of the next triode, but their frequency has been altered because of the varistors uh, interaction with the capacitance of the tube and the frequency will be rhythmically higher, lower, higher, lower in exact accordance with the frequency of the oscillation loop. In a way, it's as if instead of your hand turning the uh, pot up and down uh, on the uh, first diagram that we saw, an invisible hand is turning two pots up and down, giving you twice the effect and yielding a alteration in the frequency of the music signal that is uh, rhythmic and at exactly the same rate as the speed of the oscillation loop. And as you know, we can speed up the oscillation signal or slow it down. We can increase the frequency and reduce the frequency so that we can alter the rate of uh, the modulation that we have out here with our vibrato signal. Now I apologize for the kind of grainy appearance here of this uh, schematic, but there are no schematics for this circuit other than the one glued to the floor of the cabinet. Uh, what you can get on the internet is a lousy photograph of that schematic, so I'd made my own lousy photograph of it and uh, altered it uh, using uh, Photoshop and uh, boosted the contrast and made it a lot easier to read. But let's see if this circuit in the magnetone amp 
resembles the one that we just looked at. Look up here. Here is our triode with our two varistors outputting a mixed signal to the grid of the next triode. That much is identical. Also look down here and we have our oscillation loop outputting a signal to the grid of the triode to which the varistors are connected. So the magnetone circuit is exactly the same as the one we just well enough testing, scoping, measuring and assessing I think it's time to uh, assemble the magnetone uh, panoramic model 1210 put it back in the cabinet with its speaker and see how it sounds with a guitar well now it's time to turn the mighty magnetone panoramic 1210 over to the tender mercies of Jack and Ollie uh, to be rung out today on a uh, 1960s Gretsch Tennessean. You see Jack's back here anxious to start playing. So uh, if that sounds appealing, then stay tuned, because here it comes. Since these old Filtertron pickups have a rather low output, we're going to have to crank up the volume control a bit to get uh, the, sort of the typical volume that we're used to. Uh, let's uh, try the low gain input. This will be channel 1. <laughs> I also wanted to add that the hum you're hearing here in the background is from the pickups themselves. Uh, it's not from the amp. The amp itself is dead quiet. Okay, now we'll go with the high gain uh, input on the amp and see what you think. <coughs> Okay, now uh, what we've all been waiting for, let's try about a 50-50 setting here on the vibrato and see what it sounds like. Wow, i got to tell you, uh, it's absolutely different from tremolo in my book, and Jack and Ollie agree, that it's uh, much more musical and uh, more subtle and really doesn't disrupt the notes at all. It, it accentuates them and improves them. I, I'm very impressed. I hope you are too. Okay, now let's try maximum speed and maximum intensity of the vibrato. Okay, now how about maximum intensity and medium speed? Okay, now we've switched over to channel 2. It should sound pretty much like channel 1. Let's see.
Okay, uh, now let's switch back to the uh, regular shop guitar that I've used on almost every uh, video that I've done. And uh, we'll do a little comparison here. We'll do channel one and some vibrato and see how it sounds with that guitar. Okay, now we'll try uh, the vibrato on channel one. Both are set at medium speed and medium intensity. Okay, now we're going to try uh, wide open on both the uh, intensity and speed of the vibrato. I think Chris would approve of that version. What do you think? Well, I guess that's about it on this video featuring the super nice original Magnatone Panoramic Model 1210 Amp. And I would like to offer a very special thanks to all the Patreon patrons and PayPal contributors whose contributions made the purchase of this amp and thus the production of this video possible. If you would like to join them in helping us uh, acquire new and interesting gear and make more advertising free videos, I will include uh, links within the video description to enable you to do so. I've got uh, several more videos in production uh, featuring some really interesting amps including a Silvertone uh, 1474. I think you're going to find it interesting. So, uh, in the words of Jim Morrison, I guess the music's over, so it's time to turn out the lights. See you next time.